Yeah. Testing, where's the mic on? One, two, isn't there one? No, oh, one, two, three, four. Well, we got, you know, get the volume set. Testing, one, two, three, four. Testing, one, two, three, four. Testing, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four. Uh, this is Steve Nelson. This is tape number one of the Doolittle's Raiders. With me are General Jimmy Doolittle, Hank Potter, and Dick Cole. Uh, tapes for American Legion magazine. Uh, really, to start this, uh, they say when you interview, you should always have an icebreaker. I don't have any, but I have one question I've always been curious about. In the, as I read the different books on the raid, is the Chinese people. That, that seems so grateful and so good to your entire 16 crews or the 15. Um, you got a, you got a when you, the three of you, uh, landed in, in China, uh, what were your first impressions? Or when the first Chinese people you met, what did you think? Uh, what was things that might have, I know it's a long time to remember, but things that might have been going through your mind at that time? Well, he, we all had different experiences. I was, when I landed, I was the last one out of the airplane, and when I landed, I landed near a little Chinese house, and uh, the uh, window, the blinds were drawn, but you could see light around the drawn blinds. I knocked on the door and said, Lucia Megua, which we were assured meant I am an American, whereupon they bolted the door and turned out the lights. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the night and in the morning uh, walked along and found a Chinese man carrying a couple of buckets and uh, he couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Chinese. So I asked this chap, by drawing pictures, I drew a picture of a railroad line, then I drew a picture of a railroad station, pointed at it, indicating that's where I wanted to go. He took me to the nearest military barracks, and uh, uh, after they had interrogated me, they took me to the governor of the province, who was most helpful. Thank you. Well, the first uh, Chinese I saw actually was uh, an old lady who was in a little village who was doing her morning ablutions. And I walked right on by her because, frankly, I didn't know whether I was Chinese, Japanese, or what. And uh, I walked on by, and shortly thereafter, a small child came running and tugged at me and indicated that I should come back to the village. But, uh, my first impression was one that I didn't know what they were, and when I couldn't talk to them, and made it even worse. Dick? Well, uh... I think I was one of the most fortunate out of the whole group because my parachute drifted over a big pine tree and I never did touch the ground. All I had to do was open up the harness and climb down the tree. And I slept in the tree that night and the next morning I started to walk and I uh, came across one person who was a woodcutter, a Chinese woodcutter. And he indicated that he didn't want to have anything to do with me and so I took that as a hint. and just walked and uh, toward evening I came to the place that the general had arrived at and in the little house were these pictures of the railroad station and then there was a B-25 with five parachutes coming out and through sign language and so forth why they I managed to make them understand take me where they took him and we got together. How, how long was it before all of your crew got together? Did all five of you finally get together in China before you left? Uh, yes, but it was an afternoon of that day before we all, uh, before we all got together. Because they jumped one at a time, and the airplane was flying on, and so they were spread out, spread out quite a ways. Uh, Dick was the one, the penultimate one to jump. I was the last, so that's why he got to me quicker than the rest. And Hank, you, well, and you and Bay were didn't come in until the next day, right? Oh, no, we all got, we, all, we, we arrived by late evening. Yeah. Been, Hi, Doc. But, but in, the meantime, in the meantime, uh, while these people had uh, 
run into folks and were smarter and drew pictures and saw him. Uh, Fred Bramer, our bombardier, and myself uh, ended up uh, being uh, asked to go to jail at one time, and then uh, when we saw there were bars on the windows, we walked by that, but uh, we were followed and were under the control of uh, five people with guns for a while and had all our identification until we were fortunate enough to uh, be found, I guess you'd say found, by, again, a young fellow who could speak enough American to make it known that we were, uh, were friends. And he was coming, I think, from the, uh, the guerrilla headquarters, possibly, that uh, General had already made some contact, but I don't know. But anyhow, uh, then we got our, began to get our weapons and our identification back. Had any of you ever parachuted before? <laughs> yes, I had saved my life twice on a parachute, and I had also parachuted for fun after taking the course in parachute packing in 1919, I guess. Was that your first time out, uh, Hank or Dick? Or? That was my first and only. That was my first time. Did, uh, what were your feelings? Can you remember back that far as you made that first jump? After the initial uh, shock and so forth, I liked it. It was very quiet and <laughs> I enjoyed it. Uh, Next, the next question, <clears throat> how long did you work together as, as a crew before you took off? We had about six weeks, if I remember, of training, and uh, that is what all of the crews had. The uh, airplanes had to be modified with additional tanks installed, certain modifications made, but we were able to use other airplanes for part of the training, and we finally got our own airplanes and finished the training in our own airplane. Was there uh, any doubt in your mind when you took off that carrier that you were going to be airborne? Uh, we didn't worry because there was a 30-knot wind. The carrier was making about 20 knots into it, so there was an effective 50-knot wind across the deck. So uh, the only thing that would have really worried us had there been a dead calm, in which case it would have been critical getting off the deck. Two airplanes had taken off with light loads prior to uh, our takeoff. And so uh, not from our, not from, not with us, but prior to us starting on the mission. So we knew that an airplane could take off and had taken off and uh, Although they did not have as heavy a load as we did, with a strong wind, we felt quite sanguine that we were all right. So the wind was really, the, the bad wind, weather the was in was, your favor to, the to wind, have that uh, wind. The wind was putting up a pretty bad, uh, very high sea, which the carrier was obliged to slow down in, and that's why it could only make about 20 knots. But uh, the, uh, despite the fact that it made the carrier pitch, we occasionally took waves aboard, it was uh, very advantageous to us. Now, uh, I guess getting back to the Raiders today, uh, I, you three can speak for your crew. Uh, you've stayed very close together for the last 30 years. You, you meet every year, we annually? Meet, or, uh, we have met almost every year, except during the Korean War. During the war in Korea, uh, many of our boys were in Korea. It didn't seem fair for the rest of us to have a reunion when perhaps a majority of us couldn't attend. So we skipped some reunions during the Korean War. Otherwise, we've had one every year. Uh, next question is just a, a general comment from each of you. Uh, when you look uh, back at what you did 30, 40 years ago, and you look at, uh, say, the Air Force today, aviation in, in general, do, uh, do you feel maybe this was uh, the beginning of uh, something where we proved we could do the impossible and we can do anything we want to? Well, uh, as we look back on aviation, let me speak, speak as the patriarch. Uh, the thing that impresses me most about aviation is first that during World War I, when I started to fly, a fighter plane cost about $5,000. Very simple uh, with a machine gun, but uh, very simple indeed. In World War II, a fighter plane, a 
P51 or a P47, for instance, uh, cost about $50,000 or 10 times as much. In Korea, the first jet fighters were used. They cost about a half a million dollars or a hundred times as much. Today, a modern fighter plane costs more than five million dollars. So a fighter plane today costs about a thousand times what a fighter plane cost in World War I. Of course, it is much bigger, much heavier, has tremendous capabilities that the little World War I fighter didn't have but it gives some indication as to the change and the complexity, the capability, and the cost of aircraft today versus aircraft back that far. And remember, remember that's still a hundred times more than they cost in World War II, which we are talking about. Uh, the other thing that impresses us is something that you brought up a little earlier, apropos of the takeoff. Uh, takeoff. Uh, in the early days of aviation was sometimes difficult if the altitude was high. It was difficult with, if the day was very hot because sometimes your engine would heat up before you could get the, the airplane airborne. And uh, if you did get it airborne, it, you'd have to come down right away because of an overheated engine. So uh, uh, when we think of how uh, complicated the takeoff might have been in the olden days. We're reminded now that we have three, four really airplanes that will take off and start to climb and accelerate during climb. By that I mean that they have more power than weight. The F-14, F-15, F-16 and the 17-18 combination airplane uh, will all accelerate in vertical flight, whereas we're talking about a time when airplanes wouldn't even stay in the air if the, <laughs> if the air wasn't just right. I think those two things impress me more than, than anything else in aviation. I don't know how the other fellows feel. Well, certainly we got a, we got a better uh, look at uh, airplanes than I could uh, ever get. But there's one thing I think that uh, the general missed that impresses me, and that is that my contact with the people that fly these airplanes, I think they have also improved in training and in skill to handle this type of airplane. I don't know whether that uh, meets with the same thinking of others, but uh, the, the ones I, that I do have talked with, I'm quite impressed with their their training dedication, and yes, to go back to ACA, I think they'd do the same job when the time came, if it, if it ever has to come. Do you have a comment? Well, no, my comments are about the same as Hank. Uh, my son Richard is in the Air Force, and uh, I've met some of the people that uh, he's serving with, and I have all the confidence in the world in him. I think they really have a lot going for him. Okay, then. The next question here is uh, just a simple one. Did you have a lot of faith in that old B-25? Me? I haven't. I had all the faith, but the people I, beyond the B-25, of course, again, I had faith in my pilots who happened to be sitting here with me, unfortunately. <laughs> but to let you know, yes, I had faith in it. I even flew in a B-25 just a short while ago. They're still flying today. As a uh, after you left Tokyo and you headed towards China, uh, did you have any feeling that you'd ever find that airfield over there? Uh, let me first answer your first question is about the aeroplane. There are forgiving aeroplanes and there are unforgiving aeroplanes. A forgiving aeroplane is one that corrects a mistake if you make it. An unforgiving airplane is one that amplifies a mistake if you make it. The B-25 uh, was one of the most forgiving airplanes that I ever flew. It was a very easy airplane to fly. The next light bomber or medium bomber 
uh, was the B-26, which was also an excellent airplane, but it was much more difficult to fly. Much, it was to some degree unforgiving and took a great deal more training before he could handle it properly. So uh, I'm sure that we all loved our B-25s. I just forgot the next question I was going to ask you now. Uh, when, you, when you came back to the States, what were you talking to? all of you now on this, and you couldn't say anything, you couldn't tell it. You, did you make public then that you were people to participate on, it, on the raid, uh, or did you have to hold that for a year? Or? We were uh, advised that the president was not yet ready to let the, the world know just exactly what had happened. As a matter of fact, he spoke of the airplanes coming from Shangri-La, so that it would not be known immediately that they had come from a carrier. The Japanese, of course, knew because they had seen the carrier and they'd seen the airplane. But uh, uh, there was, it was some time before the whole story of the raid was told. Didn't you kind of, as a, as a human feeling, when you got back, go on to say, hey, I was there? You know, no, I we did didn't get back at the same time. Part of the boys stayed over in the CBI, China Burma India Theater. Uh, I was the first one home. I was ordered home immediately in order to report to, to the uh, General Arnold, General Marshall, and the President. And uh, the uh, other folks came trickling in for some considerable period of time. I didn't have, have that problem to worry about because I stayed over there. Hank came back. Oh, yes, and I think there was no uh, question that uh, as far as uh, the, our public knowing that we were on the raid, uh, this was uh, well known, but uh, the details of where and how we initiated the raid, I think, was kept quiet uh, for a long period of time. Now, you were, you were split up. And when's the first time you got back together again after the raid? The first time we really got back together in numbers was in the 12th Air Force in North Africa. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but I would guess about 20 of the boys were in the 12th Air Force in North Africa. And uh, we even went so far on the... Uh, in, 19, in April 1923 to get those of us who were in North Africa together for our little celebration. The real Tokyo Flyers reunions did not start until after the war. The first one was in December of uh, 1945 at uh, uh, Miami Beach. Beach and uh, <coughs> then uh, we skipped April, the next April coming up, because we'd already had that <laughs> four months before, and we've had one every year since, except for the Korean War. Uh, I know you're busy, <clears throat> you've got friends. Uh, these tapes will be going like into the American Legion magazine, the VFW. If there's anything you know you want to say personally, you know, for publication, uh, you can go ahead with uh, 